It's uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, be back in New Zealand. Um, I gave a talk in Santiago, Chile, this summer about startup hubs globally, and I singled out uh, two places for special praise. Um, uh, one was Israel for its obvious startup uh, culture, and the second was here in New Zealand. I have rarely seen um, startup cultures like you have built. I am incredibly, um, just incredibly envious for the rest of the world for what you've done here. So I want to congratulate you. And wow, um, Marcel and, and Suze, what a great, what a great turnout for this conference. So all investment pitches have to have a safe harbor. Um, and uh, so I'm giving you uh, this safe harbor. No one is endorsing this presentation. Do not make investment decisions based on it, as I said. Contact your attorney, your task rabbit, cleaner pickup artist, your grief therapist before you make an investment decision. Uh, and these are personal opinions. I could not have given this talk um, 10 years ago uh, because the market has changed substantially. 10 years ago, if I gave this talk, people would say, Ron, this is the most absurd talk I've ever heard. Um, because we as angels don't worry about the kinds of stuff you're, you're considering. We are doing cocktail napkin deals truck talks and investing in very, very early stage companies. Now, what's happened in the United States, and I'm getting, a, I'm getting a sense that's happening here as well, is that the entire sector has moved upstream in terms of the kinds of questions we ask. Um, we now have 300 angel groups in the US. Um, they're becoming strongly institutionalized, and by that I mean lots of process, lots of formal diligence, lots of formalization of things as they invest in groups. It's no longer a gut feel, I'm gonna write a check, but we do, you know, as, as was said yesterday um, at a meeting I was at uh, with, with, with Ken, uh, it's two to four months uh, of active diligence and negotiation. Incubators and accelerators have taken our position as the first money in, uh, and they are behaving the way you, we used to behave a decade or more ago. So we are increasingly asking the kinds of questions um, that Series A investors ask. So uh, we're becoming uh, what I call mini VCs, or you might just short term that as mini me's. Um, without the rigor, without the capital, but with some of the same mindset. And this presentation is about that mindset. Um, just in our last speaker's goal was to um, reduce anxiety. If I'm successful today, I will have at least increased anxiety by, by a little bit. And he should logically have followed rather than preceded me, because if I'm successful, I will, in fact, cause some anxiety. Uh, some facts do cause anxiety regardless of the opinions you bring to them. So um, a preview. Um, please uh, meet Jane. Um, Jane is a brand new investor. Uh, she came from Twitter. Uh, she's one of the tens of thousands of newly minted angels. And uh, Jane knows a lot. Um, about communications, she knows a lot about the internet, uh, and she loves the story and product. And she's a classic uh, first-time investor who focuses on the story, the product, and the vision. Um, and because she has not know it yet, she ignores the boring stuff. And I'm here today to talk about the boring stuff. So it's the boring stuff like capital models, now you protect yourself, that in my opinion has a huge impact on whether we uh, individually and with our groups make money. So there are multiple capital models we need to be sensitive to. Um, one is your startup's capital model, and we'll talk about how you understand that. Second is the follow-on investor, most likely um, an early stage or middle stage VC, has a very different capital model, and then we have our own capital goals. And these things are necessarily misaligned and in conflict and we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to race through the presentation. It will be available um, on, uh, on Marcel and Suze's website, so I'm not going to touch on every slide. But I do want to give you a taste of some of the things you might do to protect yourself um, against capital risk. Um, so we all love the story. It's happy. It's at the beach. It's sunny out there. Capital model story in their hand is kind of like nuclear winter if it's not played right. So be aware that there's a dynamic that the the story and some of the boring stuff may not move you in the same direction. Just a, again, another word of warning, there's a spectrum of angel investing types, and you can place yourself somewhere along this a continuum. This is not as binary as it, it's out to be, but the traditional angel is intuitive driven. You go with your gut, 
Um, you focus on how great it's going to be. Uh, you get very much involved with the team. You love their passion. You love their vision. You love the product. You were swayed by their first demo. That became really important to you. You like the product. The risk there is going native too early, um, really losing your objectivity and really joining the culture before you've actually done terribly much diligence. The opposite side of this um, is the systematic investor, uh, whose buzzword is trust but verify. Conscious of risk, this person typically comes from or knows the market pretty well, has vetted the team, not just likes the team, but has done some diligence in the team, is all about metrics and milestones, um, not so much about demos, uh, and uh, is not so much concerned that she likes the product, but that customers like the product. And the risk here is knowing, feeling you know too much um, before you actually do. My, I've been a venture capitalist for 17 years and an angel for 11. And then my venture capital firm did a study of our deal memorandums, how thick they were versus the returns we generated. And for early stage investing, they were inversely correlated because we thought we knew too much. When in fact, there's very little to know about a startup. My message today is while there's very little to know about a startup beyond the team, there is a lot to know about the industry sector they play in, the history of that sector, the exits in that sector, the capital typically used by companies in that sector. So while, you know, so while my fuzzy startup may be brand new, you not, not know much, you certainly know a lot about other companies in that space and use that as, a, uh, as your, your, your secret source of knowledge. Okay. So our agenda today is talking about why we raise capital, something about capital models, a little bit about how you can instantaneously model your returns. Um, some issues to consider about all of this. Uh, two examples of a great outcome and a not great outcome that are all capital model based. And then finally, some lessons for angels for how to work in this, in this environment. So what do we buy with our equity? Anybody who says we're buying 18 months of runway, I think is missing the point. That's, that is how much runway it takes to do something important. What we're buying is metrics and milestones needed to get to the next stage of company evolution. We're not buying 18 months of runway unless that's how much it needs to get to the metrics and milestones needed for the, ne for the next funding round or to get to sustainability or to get to an exit. Um, but do not think about how much you're investing, be it not only as a percentage of your equity, but also a commitment from management to actually do something to increase their odds of success. So um, these are the kinds of, of milestones that are common, at least in the US. Um, the incubator milestone is to get to an MVP. Um, and by the time they get to me, everybody has an MVP. That's not what I focus on at all. Um, what I focus on is evidence that the key assumptions we're betting on, there's a little bit of evidence somewhere that there is at least an emerging market, that a couple of customers have looked at the product and liked it, those kinds of things. Later stage VC milestones are these assumptions better really start working so we can scale the company. Over time, this company has built an ecosystem um, that can dominate a market. But our milestones and metrics are all about early evidence that the, what the company says it wants to do, that there is, there is some reality there. Not a lot, but some. So how do you know what the metrics and milestones should be? Well, here's a, here's a foolproof method. Um, how much capital should the company raise? However much it takes to get to key metrics and milestones. And how do we know what those are? Ask a next round investor. Ask a VC. Ask a potential follow-on angel. Um, ask a corporate VC if you think they're eligible for corporate money. What would it take my company to interest you nine to 12 months from now? What would we have to accomplish? Do it two or three times. You'll begin to get consistent answers. It won't be later perfect, but it's better than throwing darts. So um, capital risk and capital models. We are in the business, VCs formally, angels informally, of managing risk and reward. And are the risks and the rewards commensurate? So the classic risks we have to worry about. Um, can we make money? So technology, does it work? If it works in the lab, does it work at scale? Does it work for thousands and tens of thousands and millions of users? Is the management team right for this particular company? They may have worked together, they may be great, but they not, may not be right for this business. Uh, a friend of mine showed me a great management team a few years back, three Cisco engineers with award-winning routing algorithms. 
they came to us with the following deal, these three guys. We want to build the internet's first pure play site for selling women's handbags. True story. Um, great team, wrong business, not a woman on the team, no retail experience. So is the team right for the business? Market risk, will customers buy it? Competitive risk, can this company eventually dominate its markets? Because the iron law of exits is if your company is not going to be one, two, or three um, in, in, in exiting, as in big exits, they're not going to make, we're not going to make much money. Uh, and the first company that exits big typically takes as much as 50% of all the value in the market. So um, it is not good if your company's ambition is to be a player and to be happy with being number 10 in a market. Chances are neither you nor they are going to do well. Exit risk. How do we get paid? And that is not our immediate goal. Our immediate goal is to build great companies, not for exit, but build great companies and good things will happen. But can, at some point, they return capital via IPO, via M&A, uh, or potentially um, via a private equity buyout? Finally, um, capital risk. And that's the subject of the rest of our conversation. What are the risks involved in money itself? So the key capital risks are, if the company is inefficient, they're going to consume gobs of capital. Um, is there a follow-on investor after this round? Who is going to follow us? Uh, we don't want to be the last money in before the company closes its doors. Uh, premature financing before a company has achieved those milestones and metrics. So do you believe the management team is capable of planning well and executing well to achieve the things that we all need them to do so the next tranche of money comes in? Uh, big risk for us is change in capital market sentiment. People loved social. They adored social until a few years ago. They didn't anymore. So fashions and fads can change quickly. Um, we have seen the culling of the unicorns when unicorns went from get big fast and get ridiculous valuations to, um, you know, the market's slowing down. Maybe you ought to make some profit. And one of my companies is, uh, was severely damaged when, when that transition, transition happened. Uh, we risk dilution, we risk pay to play, we risk cram down, all those term sheet kinds of risks uh, that can significantly and permanently hurt our valuation. We have a risk when investors around the table are misaligned. I invested at 50 cents a share, you invested at three bucks a share, he came in at 10 bucks a share, there's an offer on the table for five bucks a share to sell a company. At which point all hell breaks loose and there is lots of horse, tra horse trading around. So you want to make sure your investors are aligned and you as early angels have an opportunity to help shape who comes in as investors. And I've got more to say about that. Um, big liquidation preference stacks is, is one of the absolute deal killers out there. So don't be greedy. If you want liquidation preference, really don't go beyond a 1x. Because every time you do that, you establish a precedent that other investors are going to want. So a reasonable liquidation preference uh, is uh, our friend. An egregious one is an absolute returns killer for us. Anybody who doesn't understand liquidation preference, grab me or grab Ken Erskine um, afterwards. Management carve-outs. Company's not doing so well. The stock is underwater. They're, the employee stock options are underwater. They're going to want a carve-out. They're going to want first money out under some conditions, despite the fact that their options are useless. Why? They're not going to work hard if we don't give them one. So um, if management misses goals, again, that is dilutive to us. So all of these things are what I consider capital risk. Amongst the things you should most be concerned about is who follows us. The more capital we raise, obviously, the more risk. And we'll talk about that momentarily. So um, uh, a, 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 a well-known analyst who studies angel investing did a study of capital in versus capital out, and more to come about that. But the, what he found, Rob Wiltbank found, was that there is no correlation between more capital being raised and angel returns. It is utterly flat. It is a random distribution. There is no correlation between investing more and getting more out. To mitigate capital, understand the company's capital model. And ask yourself some very, very simple questions. Again, look at the sector. Look at companies like this that are a little bit ahead or have gone public. Um, or look at comparable transactions that have recently been funded. How much money do you think and does management think the company needs uh, over time to get to the next round of funding? How much to scale? How much do companies like this company typically consume in cash before they exit? 
How many rounds of funding do companies typically get in this sector? And I'll show you some ways to find that out. Um, what's the timing of their cash flow? In their, in their theoretical business model, do they get paid in 30 days or do they get paid upon deployment, which could be six to nine months? And if that cycle lengthens, what are the risks of them running out of money prematurely because their cash cycle um, is very, very, very inefficient? In our way, can we, can we speed that up? Um, what's the capital efficiency of the business model? And we'll, we'll talk about the most infamous model, SaaS, shortly. Um, and so again, you will not know the specifics for your company, but you will have a general template for your industry. So the kinds of questions you want to ask management is, what's the minimum capital needed to accomplish the metrics you've told us you want to accomplish? We've committed a quarter of a million dollars. We all agree you need 750,000. Where is the rest going to come from? And my best practice is when management says, here is a warrant bonus for writing an early check before the round closes, I would politely decline that. Um, you want to write a check uh, and close the round when everybody else has their money in. Um, you don't want to be the last check to be written before the company uh, has to do something extreme. Uh, so ask yourself where the money is coming from. Ask them if they know what metrics they need to achieve with our money to get to the next round and how they're going to find that out. So these are the kinds of responsible questions that do not require management to have made all kinds of assumptions about the future of the business. This is just good practical sense about knowing the field they are in. And if they're in tune with companies like themselves, they ought to have at least some reasonably triangulatable answers. So I would ask, who do you benchmark yourself against? What companies do you measure your own progress against? Why them? And, and how are you doing? And then finally, um, uh, what are the exit multiples for companies like you? And just, you can get these off of investment banker reports. The web is filled with them of recent transactions. And what was the multiple the company received as a function of its sales? Uh, this is all basic, easy research. It does not require the company's business model to be all that accurate. But these are about knowing the sector you're in um, as, well as, the, as the, well as the company's business. Some of the dirty facts in our business, two thirds of venture-backed companies fail to yield a positive return. These are the ones that ever exit, not counting the 90% that never even exit. So for the companies that exit, 64%, um, two thirds return less than the money invested. This is for venture capital. If you look at angel returns, uh, actually angel returns on average, our portfolios, according to Wilt Bank, should yield about a 2.6x overall across all of our deals. But if you look at actual individual deals, um, the top 10% return all the money. Uh, and so about, about you know, something like 10% uh, return um, 10x or 30x, the rest, the rest are laggards. That's where the money comes from for angel deals. My favorite chart, this is how much money is returned between uh, the, the 1996 and 2006 for all angel invested deals in the US and the UK for which there was available data. 85% of deals, forget what your ownership stake was, the total amount of money returned to investors was less than $50 million. This included the bubble years. This included you know, 1997, 1998, 2000. Um, where people were buying up. So this is all of those deals. Um, and today's data, from which I've looked at, don't differ all that much. So the lesson here is scale your input, your investment, to the likely returns you're likely going to get. And if you think you're going to get a billion dollar outcome, great, I wish you well. Many people on occasion do. But I wouldn't bet on it, that, you know, unless there's something extraordinary going on. So I have done my own analysis of how much money went in and went out uh, for M&A and IPO since, uh, since 2010. Uh, and the critical measure here is the multiple of invested capital. Now, this is not say what any individual investor made, because that's based on their personal valuation on the deal. But this is how much money went into the company at total how much came out. And um, on average, um, for, um, for, for mergers and acquisitions, uh, the amount of money that went in to successful exits was almost $300 million. However, on a median, uh, that's how much came out, uh, sorry, about $300 million um, in M&A value. But the medians, excluding Facebook and Google and all of the high flyers, if you get the median, eliminates all of that, 
Um, the, median, uh, the median exit uh, was $100 million, and the amount of money it took to get there was around $15 million. So if you look at IPOs in contrast, um, the amount of money that, to, that at the median level came out from IPOs was around $400 million, and the capital uh, was $100 million to get there. So when a company tells you, we're an astonishingly capital efficient, we're never going to need to raise more than 3 or $4 million, that may be true. But if they have global market ambitions, as many companies in New Zealand do, um, if they do want to exit on a major market um, in Europe or the US, the chances are they're going to need to raise more than that 2 or $3 million. Hence, we have a capital risk. So again, a a ask them why they believe that $2 million is all they're ever going to need. It's a story here all the time. And I say, you've just violated the laws of startup physics. So if you look at the, at the average money going out and v versus coming in uh, by different sectors uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the past 10 years or so, um, data center was the highest flyer, typically got 13 times the money invested. Um, and certain parts of telecom were, were, were certainly in the laggard space. Uh, this data was computed um, about two months ago from data mostly from 2014 to the present, but included some data as far back as 2010. So let us understand um, our strategy. What is an angel's capital strategy? What we want pro forma is something in the range of 10 to 30 times our money back for taking the earliest serious risk. Um, we want a reasonable valuation so that we own 15 to 30 percent going in. That's Certainly what the Band of Angels wants, we will not do deals in which we own significantly less than this. Um, well, we always assume we need to reserve capital, uh, maybe as much as two to three times. Um, but typically, uh, we will have our syndicate try to reserve, or at least have the capability, if we put in a million bucks now, at least a half a million to a million going forward over time if we have to, to preserve our position if we like it. And we have a debate about that. Many people believe that you should never follow on but if your company is doing pretty well uh, and you don't want to give um, free cash to, uh, to later stage investors, um, prudent people may consider following on. Uh, so is, uh, it, we're sensitive to businesses, kinds of businesses, for example, like semiconductor manufacturing that consume hundreds of millions of dollars. So these are some of the things that, that we're concerned with. We're very sensitive to liquidation preferences um, because uh, there may be, in, in some of my companies, have a 150 to $300 million liquidation preference stack, which means all that money goes to investors before anybody else makes any money. And typically, as angels, we're at the bottom of the stack, the last to get paid before common gets paid. We're sensitive to pay-to-play terms and term sheets. That is, if we don't invest, we essentially get crammed down as a way of forcing more money around the table. So it is not unusual for your going in money to be 15% and your going out money to be 5, 6, 7%. That's how much you own at exit. If the company requires follow-on capital. Now, if it doesn't, that's great. Um, so I have a quick and dirty back of the envelope way of kind of figuring out, is this investment is worth, you know, worth, worth the risk? So I'm our syndicate. Three angel groups are putting in uh, 1.5 million. By the way, these slides will be on uh, the New Zealand Angel website. Um, so uh, they'll, be, they'll be distributed to you. So we're going to put 1.5 million as a group in. We, we think based on comparables, based on knowing the market, based on looking at management's capabilities, based on looking at simple companies that have exited, we think a $30 million exit goal is pretty good in terms of how much Oh, the revenues will be, let's say, four to five years from now. We assume today that's, that's the revenue multiple. The price people are getting in the public markets is four times revenue. So we're going to assume that we're going to get, as a syndicate and management and all other investors, about $120 million from this deal. And that's not a bad outcome for software companies. Um, most software companies achieve 50 to $100 million at best. But yes, we all know the billion-dollar outcomes, but those are not typical. So how much money did we put in? Well, we invested at a 8.5 million pre-money valuation, giving us a 10 million post, giving us 15%. But we know that this company, a database company, is going to need more capital. So we know that we're going to have to put in probably another half a million to a million dollars. 
So our 15% equity might be around 6% at exit. Um, and so what is our return? Um, our return is the amount of money we put in initially 1.5 plus our syndicate partners, another one. So we're going to get back 7.2 million. Um, and we're going to have put in um, something like a two point, uh, like something uh, um, uh, uh, like the uh, like two and a half million. Our return is 2.8, and this is just based on market comparables and knowledge of sectors. Is it going to be accurate? No. Is it going to be approximate? Well, it's probably not going to be 10 times this, or it's probably not going to be you know 10 percent of this. It's it's a rough benchmark. Is this deal worth doing? Probably not because the return is low. So what do we do? We go back to management and fact-based, fact-based based on this kind of stuff, where we can actually argue, and as opposed to saying, I just don't like this deal, we can say the valuation is too high. We can't make the kinds of returns that angels want to make at, uh, at, at an 8.5 million pre. Your revenues this year really, if we were honest, don't justify, really don't justify more than the four and a half pre-money valuation. You're going to do maybe a million dollars this year. I'll give you four and a half for that. I won't, I won't, I won't give you eight and a half. And we start having this conversation that, again, is fact-based. The valuation comes down. Our equity goes up. Nothing else really changes. And we go from 2.8 to about 7.2 pro forma theoretical return. Again, this is not the way life is going to end, but it's a basis for thinking through our, our assumptions based on what we know about the sector. So we talked about revenue multiples. Um, and uh, uh, the software equity group uh, does a quarterly report on what software multiples are. And you can see that they vary widely um, from mobile content, uh, which is cheap, 1.3 times revenues, um, all the way uh, to financial software, uh, software, which gets around a 4.4x. So check these multiples. They're all available publicly. The software, uh, the software equity group publishes them. Um, my favorite model to talk about is, uh, for our purposes, is SaaS. Now, you all know how SaaS works, right? Um, that SaaS companies have to onboard customers, have to invest in customer support, uh, have to invest in sales and marketing up front. And instead of getting a big check, a $250,000 check at signing, they earn that money over the course, over the course of three years. So the model is back-end loaded revenue-wise. If they miss a quarter, things go haywire. So this is, it's not unusual for a SaaS company to consume $100 million before they exit because of the back-end nature of the model. The faster they grow, the more capital they need. And at some point, things even out. So again, the impact of the business model on your returns can be pretty extreme. Now, there are many reasons why your SaaS company will not need this kind of capital. But if it's a neutral company about which you don't know a lot, except that they're SaaS, uh, question, at least questionable. It. SaaS sectors, as I've said, have very, very different SaaS multiples. Uh, uh, this will be in your packet. Uh, the reasons why multiples vary, from how, what's the gross margin of, of the sector or the business, how fast is the sector growing, and so forth. So um, what has to happen for us to make money? Let's kind of begin to summarize. What has to happen for us to do well? The company has to execute well without a down round. The company needs to understand its metrics. We need to have multiple ways to realize an exit. If there's only one potential buyer, it's going to be pretty tough for us to exit. The company has to have a sector who, that the market likes, that buyers like, that um, investors like, where the, where the sector multiples continue to grow over time. Um, and the company has to be capital efficient. So what's a venture capitalist's strategy? The VC um, wants uh, 5x minimum to as much as 20x and potentially more for the risk they're taking. Um, East Coast US VCs, the joke is, care more about fear and more about capping the downside with liquidation preferences, with coupons and so forth. Uh, West Coast VCs are optimistic. Um, it's gonna, how great is it going to be? And their term sheets can be somewhat different. Um, they, uh, the, the many VCs view their first investment as basically a right to put larger capital to work over time. And so some VCs, most of my friends, want to write checks over time that are, uh, will total maybe between 10 and $30 million if it's a big fund. Um, so their interest is putting money to work. Is that good for us? 
well, if the company grows, never has a down round, valuations are always up, yes, that's good. But if there's a hiccup, if there's a down round, if there are more liquidation preferences, if there's any punitive stuff, that is terrible for us. So we are not necessarily interested in throwing vast amounts of money at our companies. Um, so uh, they want to deploy money over the life of a deal, and they usually have a process for doing that. They have a deal target. Um, so VCs have an interest. So uh, read this at your leisure. It's a slide about how VCs, angels, and management's interests often do not align, um, and ways, uh, ways to think about that. But, but. So um, issues to consider, M&A or IPO? Um, we all think of IPO as the gold ring. It's certainly the most, the most fancy and, and honorable form of exit in the sense you get, it's, you got bragging rights with IPOs. You often don't with M&A. Um, but if you look at the numbers I presented earlier, a M&A can actually return um, a larger percentage of capital than an IPO. If you look at the last seven years of data, um, M&A has done better than IPOs have on terms of cash in versus cash out. Uh, the pros of M&A are it's manageable capital risk. Um, we are not going to go through six, seven, eight, nine rounds of funding, typically. Uh, but we're going to not return as well. We're going to have a much lower return, maybe a quarter of the money that we would have had had we, had we IPO'd. In terms of IPO, um, the good news for us is, in the US at least, liquidation preferences are eliminated during an IPO. Everybody converts to common, so there's no big stack that's going to crush us. The returns are higher. But the negatives are there's way more. People who do, uh, who do IPOs have at least two to three more rounds than people who M&A. And the more rounds you take, the less we are important. You know, think seven years, eight years from now. How important was the initial angel group's investment? Does anybody even know us anymore? Are they going to look out for our interests at that point? So the longer you ride the deal, the more we become functionally irrelevant. Um, and so there's more opportunity for, for angel disruption. So how do we deal with VC risk? Are they our friends, or our enemies? Um, well, let me say the answer to that question is yes. So if there's one big takeaway for me um, here, since um, we can be bosom buddies or, or we can have opposing interests, is introduce VCs to your company. Be the sponsor. Um, get to know the VCs. And in most cases, when you've established a kind of cultural bond, they will look out for us. They will be less willing to do uh, pay-to-play kinds of revisions. They will, they will create opportunities for investors like us to follow on in their deals. So be friendly with VCs. At the same time, retain as long as you can a board seat, because that's how you get to know them. So when there's time to horse trade around follow-on rounds, you're at the table able to make the case. And again, trust but verify. If you're going to bring a VC into the deal, interview them. Ask them what their capital strategy is. Ask them how much money they want to deploy over the life of the deal. Um, just get a sense as to whether this is going to be a positive or maybe another kind of outcome for us. So uh, I'm going to conclude with two stories. Um, first of all, is a tale of, of my unvarnished greed. Uh, I invested in a, uh, a, a company that, that was a two-sided business model. Um, it, uh, it dealt with consumers uh, in order to uh, have a data play and other kinds of play um, with small business. Um, and at one point in this company's evolution, I think that's to say it's true, one out of every six North American residents uh, is a, is a uh, either not exactly a customer, but a user of their product. Astonishing. They did uh, 10 rounds of funding um, about uh, three years ago. Uh, I was offered um, a 17x my investment. Um, and the, uh, at the same time, new investors came in, a well-known brand name investor um, uh, came in uh, at around a valuation of 30 times my money. So I'm sitting here saying, well, I know this investor pretty well, and they're going to want three times their money. So I'm up about 100x. So I'd be crazy to sell at 17x. I had, you know, I had visions of, uh, you know, of, of buying a Greek island, maybe buying Greece, for that matter. Uh, and um, my, own, my, own, my own comments to you today were blissfully ignored. I ignored my own advice. Uh, and I'm uh, embarrassed to say that. I said, you know, I'm going to hold, I'm going to hang on. It was the largest investment I'd ever made. I'd followed on a couple of times. Um, but I really smartly uh, declined. Then market sentiment changed. Unicorns started dying. 
Um, and the market sentiment went from get big fast, get eyeballs, get users, to get profitable. And the CEO of this company um, was an eyeballs person, not a profit person. Uh, management had big changes. Um, uh, so, uh, and right now I'm sitting behind a $300 million liquidation preference stack and the company's value has been cut significantly. I came into the last round, so I will probably at least get two times my last money. Um, but I went from, you know, buying a Greek island to, you know, maybe being able to refuel my car. <laughs> a better story uh, is a company whose name I will use because um, they're a great story, a company called Talia. Um, uh, Talia uh, is, um, again, my favorite word. It's boring. What do they do? They factor invoices. So you're a startup um, who, who, who has issued IBM an invoice for a million bucks, and IBM is sitting on more money, or at least they used to, more money than God. Uh, Talia makes a deal saying, will you accept, um, uh, will you accept IBM, uh, will, you, will you pay right now in exchange for a significant, let's say, 8 or 10% discount? And they use SAP as their back end. They've got pricing algorithms that are world class. Um, so I had invited them to a Band of Angels open house. And they presented this story. Three guys from Germany, didn't go to Stanford, never been to the Valley before. But they'd done it before in a previous company as middle managers. Now they were running this company. And they had um, Coca-Cola and California's largest gas utility as customers. Um, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. They were an experienced team. They wanted 1.2 million. The investors had a food fight. Six investor groups competed. Three of us won it. We forced them to take three million bucks, not 1.2. Um, and uh, the last round valuation uh, was about 240 million. Um, they are on the bomb run for good things over the next two to three years. And last year, the White House, U.S. White House, named them the small business software package that every small business should use as a way of not having to raise venture capital because you get much prompter payment. Uh, the cash, the contract to cash cycle is much less if you use their stuff. So this, is, this has been my most fun company. Will it be the most profitable? Probably not. Is it going to have a good exit? I expect they will. Um, but they've done all the right things. The capital requirements have been extremely modest. The last round, about six years later, was about $20 million. They have not raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, I was asked uh, to talk about things that make these kinds of exits attractive to buyers, just a few things. Remember that 90% of, of, of the exits are M&A, not um, IPO. Uh, private equity buyouts are increasing uh, as, part of that, as part of the buyout thing. But remember, the bigger the check your company and your investors want, the fewer the buyers. So if, if, if you've raised boatloads of capital with your follow-on VCs or with private equity people, whatever, and they put two to $300 million to work, they're going to expect someone to write a check for a few billion dollars. If this is an IT company, the number of companies that can write that big a check you know, is not all that large. So remember that you, somebody has to exit this deal if it's not going to IPO. So just remember that. Um, Remember that 85% of our deals uh, that never take venture um, exit at under $50 million, so scale your investment right. Um, IPO processes, one of the best ways to get bought is to tell the market you're used going for an IPO. Because people who are thinking of buying you will get scared and say, well, I can never afford them once they're a public company, so I better buy them now. Um, a similar trick is, is, to, uh, is to go into active business development mode looking for partnerships uh, or maybe follow on capital from strategics. Um, and uh, if they get to date you, they might want to marry you. So these are all the kind of common tricks that, uh, that, that portfolio companies and their boards use. Um, so use BizDev as a cover for M&A solicitation. Remember Steve Ballmer's uh, caution. This is very important for our psychology. I'm going to buy you for what you're worth to Microsoft, not what you're worth to your investors. So part of M&A strategy is to figuring out where there's the best match, who has got the best synergy, the best sales force, the best channels, who can really leverage your product. And then you make a case about that kind of value. And it has nothing to do with how much capital is going on in the company. It has what can this company generate uh, for the buyer. Um, M&A issues. Uh, this is really nasty, uh, and uh, I, I would hope that, um, that if you do stay on boards, at some point you have people really familiar with governance um, and M&A representing angel groups, uh, and to make sure that there's at least one more person on the board who's aware of this stuff. 
When people hear about M&A, the rats crawl out of the woodwork. Every contractor who worked for you in month six where there's no paper now claims he owns 1% of the company. Um, the person who sold you the IP, if you spun out of a big company, might start claiming, well, we really own that. You can't use it, merely because they want to negotiate a, a piece of the, the M&A. So be aware there are lots of issues. Um, uh, and um, I have, as, as any banker's room, any M&A banker's room? At least people who admit it. Uh, um, you know, we, we like to say that every deal has 99 deaths and hopefully 100 lives. But um, things like um, having your CEO negotiate for you, um, uh, it, un it's not unusual for a CEO to negotiate a deal for himself and the management team, and where suddenly the buyer, as Cisco did, or did to us a couple of occasions, where Cisco said, you know all those returns you're going to get? Well, I want, to, I, I, would, I, would want to, I want to divert some of the money that's going to the investors to management as a management bonus or a management retention bonus coming out of investor proceeds. So these are all deal killers. This is why a deal can happen, by the way, in year two of your investment, right? Uh, things happen. So have someone in the angel group be really expert about exit stuff um, that can hurt you. Uh, use a real venture law firm. Um, uh, get smart. So I was asked you know, to talk about things that people might not know. But these are, these are my big deal killers. I have seen every one of them. Buyer sandbagging. Um, anybody know what that means? During diligence, the buyer finds out something that is truly negative about you and doesn't say anything. Then at one minute to midnight as the deal is closing, you know, we just discovered this thing about you. We really want to lower that price by 50%. Um, in some states in the US, that is illegal. Um, in some states in the US, it is not illegal. So again, lots of stuff can hurt you. So let's, uh, let's just kind of lessons for angels. Um, this is the typical flow of, of, of money um, in a startup. I have my last three exits have been here, VC buyouts. Um, whereas in the case of Talia, I got five times my money back in seven months because the Series B investor wanted more than they could buy from the company. And this has now been happening regularly. Again, my last three exits have been high return VC buyouts. So remember that your personal capital strategy may be different from your startups. What's in your startup's best interest may not be in your interest. You, as a board member, have a fiduciary responsibility to the startup, not to yourself. So keep those conflicts in mind. Um, cultivate VC partners to protect yourselves. Uh, and uh, an early exit reduces the risk of later stage cram down um, by people who have never met you. So capital risk mitigation strategies Understand your company's capital model. Don't confuse yours with, their, with theirs. Um, identify potential misalignments between you and later stage investors. And use your board friendships you've made as a way of mitigating them or reducing them. Um, monitor milestones and metrics. There's one thing to take away from this talk. It's milestones and metrics are what angel investing is about, even though we're uncertain about what all this stuff means. Capital efficiency is our best friend. Um, Scale your investment to what the sector is likely to generate. Look at the last five or six exits globally in your sector. Get a sense as to how much money went in, how much money went out. iBankers are glad to share this with you. Uh, and um, be vigilant because the more rounds and more funding, um, the, the risk of bad stuff happening to us is great. Reserve three bucks for every dollar you invest because your companies will need it early stage. The first check you write is not your last check. Uh, and VC buyouts are your friend. And um, as I said, help select VC partners, partner with them, befriend them. So that was uh, my message for today. Um, these slides will be available to you. But um, safe investing, and remember, it's the boring stuff that counts. Thank you.